Okay, um, good afternoon or good morning, um, everyone, wherever you are. Um, we're about to begin the webinar on uh, the Value of the Planet campaign. So a little introduction, um, so you actually get to see who's talking to you. So my name is Benjamin Tao. I am a registered architect in Singapore, a chartered surveyor and a chartered environmentalist. As you can see, I've been highly involved with RICS, both as a trustee, as a profession, and also um, as an LAT uh, and an APC assessor. So please do engage with the webinar, um, writing in your questions. Uh, we will have time for some of these to be answered at the end, and where there are common themes which we didn't quite get to answer, um, I will provide written answers to those in, in a follow-up. So please do key them down immediately when you have them. The webinar is an hour long, um, but we may continue for a little bit extra, um, depending on the questions coming through. Okay, so let's begin proper. So first of all, the Value of the Planet campaign really helps frame the built environment professional's direct response to the deep socio-ecological crisis of the Anthropocene age. Now, the image you see on the background of this slide here is one that's becoming increasingly familiar across the world. The aim of this particular webinar is to position our profession as one that is firstly aware and engaged with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the new urban agenda, as well as making sure we have a good grasp of other recent developments within the environmental sphere including within the finance industry and in international environmental law. The second aspect of it is really to promote a coordinated professional action and response to these frameworks going forward. The built environment professionals, we're at a crossroads. We are serving more sophisticated clients who have increasingly higher expectations of us whilst working in an environment with increasing competition. And that competition doesn't just come from within our profession, but also outside as others are providing services which were once exclusively in our domain. There is increasing distrust in experts and professionals also as we're often dubbed the elites. And this is quite difficult for us to navigate. Furthermore, we are talking about public advantage as well. So, you know, I would say that it is crucial that we demonstrate that we do act for the public advantage. And I argue that this includes climate change. We must be better equipped to articulate our professional value, including that that we are the professional that is a solution provider that addresses the built environment's contribution to climate change. The current forms of practice of growth and rapid urbanization is driving great socio-ecological harm. We have an opportunity to positively intervene in this process, shaping a new form of urbanization managing the diverse cultural, social and environmental context sensitively and skillfully. Faced with the scale of these challenges, the international community has responded with a range of global agreements aimed at tackling these issues individually and collectively. The most notable of these is, of course, the Paris Agreement, which aims to keep global temperatures well below the two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. We also have the new urban agenda, which was adopted at Habitat 3 in 2016. And of course, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are universal, involve the entire world, balancing the three dimensions of sustainable development. So moving on to climate change. Now, given the increasing prominence of the issues, the intent here is not to summarize climate change in any detail. You can get that anywhere, but it's to provide a stock take and an outline of the situation as it stands currently, and to contextualize why it is of great importance that we focus our efforts in promoting greater action. Urgent and unprecedented changes are needed to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Limiting the global average temperature to an increase of a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And it requires rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, inland infrastructure, which includes transport and buildings, and of course, industrial systems. Solely from an energy transition perspective, renewables would need to make 
about 70 to 85 percent of global electricity in 2050, which is a huge task. Carbon emissions would need to fall 55 percent of 2010 levels by 2030 and continue on a steep decline to zero emissions by 2050, which is a very tall ask, especially as year on year our carbon emissions are increasing, they're not stabilizing. The outcome of today's nationally determined mitigation ambitions, which has been submitted under the Paris Agreement, would lead to a global warming of between three and four degrees Celsius by 2100, with severe warming continuing afterwards. Now, leading finance companies have warned that a plus four degree world is not insurable due to the climate change risks and fit to the physical assets, which is a big issue. Now on your screen here, there's uh, the Keeling curve. Now this is taken, this is measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's taken at the same spot since 1958 in Hawaii. Now the key thing to note here is in May uh, last year, it recorded CO2 concentration at 415 parts per million, which is really alarming. To put into context, the growth in the 1990s is about 1.5 part per million a year. If you take the last decade, it is now, it was about 2.2. However, the difference between this year and last year was 3.5 parts per million, which is more than double the growth that it was in the 1990s year on year. Based on that, 450 parts per million has been assessed in climate models as the critical, to, critical concentration of CO2 where temperature rises will exceed the two degrees warming threshold beyond which the effects of global heating are catastrophic and irreversible. Now based on the current year-on-year -year increases we would cross this threshold by 2028. We're currently already at plus one degree Celsius global warming above pre-industrial levels. And to hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would likely need reach that before 2025. So realistically, we only have five years to really curb our CO2 year-on-year um, -year increases. Now, beyond just CO2, the impacts of unsustainable development are driving the following pressures. Two billion people already live in countries experiencing high water stress. And by 2030, 700 million people could be displaced by intense water scarcity. Climate-related disasters have claimed more than 1.3 million lives between 1998 and 2017. So that's beyond what would be typically seen. Atmospheric CO2, we've already touched on that, is increasing at an alarming rate. Ocean acidity has increased by 26% and is rising again in a similar trend to CO2 at an exponential increase. Beyond that, we're seeing risks of, in, of species extinctioning worse, worsening by 10%, and that's over the last 25 years. Of course, David Attenborough has been doing that uh, brilliantly and documenting that over his documentaries, but it's something that we really need to consider because our impact on that in our built environment as well as our natural environment um, aspects in our local domains are having direct impacts on that. Land degradation is affecting one-fifth of the earth's land area and the lives of one billion people. Beyond that, material footprint is rapidly growing, outpacing population and economic growth. And there's a huge disparity here with high-income countries consuming 27 metric tons per capita on average versus two metric tons for the low-income countries. But what does this all mean? We talked about a plus 1.5 or a plus two degrees Celsius, but even with the mitigation measures in place, I mentioned a four degrees Celsius by 2100, but if you look at the tropical belt, especially in Southeast Asia, you're looking at a plus eight degree world. So now in Singapore, we're looking at 30 to 32 degrees Celsius. That could move up to almost 40 degrees Celsius through large parts of the year. Now this will result in total loss of the region's coral reefs. It would cause an issue with agriculture, especially with a growing population and a 50% yield drop um, of 
food. So moving on to the built environment, which many of us are directly involved with. It's an important topic and we do have a huge role to play here. So again, I'm just going to set up a few of the challenges that we see. So in terms of urban challenges, already today, only half of urban residents have convenient access to public transport, which needs to change. Nine out of 10 urban residents will breathe polluted air. So we are talking about hum humanity's health. One in four urban residents live in slum-like conditions. And then two billion people do not have access to waste collection services. Now, all of these are within our domain to be able to have concerted action. In terms of cities themselves, they occupy 2% of the land, however, account for a large proportion of, of course, GDP, we all know, energy consumption, given their density and use, of, that leads to greenhouse gas emissions, but then global waste as well. So the built environment sector has a vital role to play in responding to the climate emergency. So buildings are responsible for almost 40% of global carbon emissions. Decarbonizing this sector is one of the most effective ways to mitigate the worst effects of climate breakdown. But listen to the language here. Mitigate the worst effects. 10 years ago, we were talking about mitigation full stop. And now we're talking about being less catastrophic. It's a big change of tone that's happened in, really, in reality in the last five or six years. Furthermore, with the global population expecting to grow by another up to 10 billion, a huge amount of that proportion being lifted out of poverty, there's a burgeoning growth of the middle class. The global constructed floor area is estimated to double by 2060. And this doubling will, of course, consume vast amounts of finite natural resources, contributing to a doubling of the global consumption of raw materials, significantly increasing our sector's emissions and obviously the climate impact. Hence, there is a great urgency for us to do things differently. And just looking at buildings, a large proportion of our time is spent indoors. And yet we hardly talk about, re in reality, how do we make these spaces wonderful places for people to be, which are healthy and responsive. I mentioned that buildings are responsible for 39% of, well, almost 40% of global carbon emissions. And construction materials are, according to World GBC, are responsible for 11% of carbon emissions. So as you heard with that growing population, a huge boom in the construction industry globally, a business as usual scenario will lead to huge amounts of damage. So I'm going to touch on now international environmental law. Now this is something I find is rarely covered in built environment forums, and yet it is something that affects us the most and, the most, and there's some really big changes that are happening here, and how this in future will filter down to our duty of care, to our potential liabilities going forward, which is why I think it's very important that we, we touch on this as part of the Value the Planet campaign. So first of all, the much talked about Paris Agreement, though in reality, how many people who cite it actually know its contents? So what I will do here is take you on a whirlwind tour of this in a few slides, taking about five minutes. So Article 2 actually provides the over overview, which is these three points. So the first one is, of course, the well-known two degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels with pursuit of efforts to keep that to 1.5 degrees Celsius, because this, through all the climate change scenario mapping and simulations, is where we're able to limit the worst of the damage. The second part of it is increasing the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change. So again, we're talking about adaptation, not about mitigation. We're too late to mitigate the adverse effects. It's now how do we limit the adverse effects and how do we adapt to them? Because there will be a level of adaptation. And then finally, how do we make sure that there are finance flows which are consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So how is that possible given that the way capital currently works today, which unfortunately seems to do the opposite. So within this agreement, every nation that signed up to it, they're supposed to provide 
the positive action, which involves the peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. Of course, it's left open to each nation to decide when that will be, and they're supposed to report it back, and to undertake rapid reductions thereafter in accordance with the best available science. And that's actually worded in there, best available science. So that doesn't mean, okay, I can get away with this. They are supposed to be held to the highest levels. And this is all there in Article 4 of the Paris Agreement. In addition, there's a requirement for the development of adaptation actions around climate change impacts, taking into account vulnerable people, places, and ecosystems, building the resilience of socioeconomic and ecological systems, including through economic diversification and sustainable management of natural resources. This is in Article 7. Now, the key here is the management, not just of the built environment and the excitement of new urbanization, but the critical role for the management of natural resources, rural, marine areas. And this is where RICS, we have an enormous strength in our various pathways, which must not be forgotten, while we quite often focus on the built environment sector. The natural environment is key. Now, the Paris Agreement is the world's first comprehensive climate agreement in reality, and it has a concerted effort to internationally frame and report on climate action, which is Article 13. But most importantly, it gives the ability to legally address losses and damages associated with the adverse effects of climate change through an internationally agreed mechanism. That's under Article 8. Now, this is important because it means going forward there is a legal mechanism to address damages and I expect this will start to be used more aggressively in the future. Interestingly, off the back of the Paris Agreement, there's a UN Global Pact in, it, in its draft. This was obviously set back a little bit by the events in Spain at the end of last year, but the Global Pact for the Environment would be critical for professionals and their actions with regard to the environment. There are three main objectives in this pack. First one, the universal right to an ecologically sound environment, guiding principles of international environmental law in one coherent legal document. So that will help reduce the tension and create clarity. And thirdly, empower citizens to hold home and neighbor governments, so not just our own governments, but neighbor governments accountable for their environmental policies. And we've already seen successful cases of this in Europe where governments have been taken to task by their, by their own citizens. But the thing to note is the turn to rights. This is critical. Every person has the right to live in an ecologically sound environment adequate for their health, their well-being, their dignity, culture and fulfillment. And this is Article 1. So bear with me on this, because this is the first global treaty where ecological sound environment is recognized as a right, as a human right. It will have a profound impact on international development, on duties of care to the environment, and the development of legal mechanisms to address environmental damages. So I think I'm going to hold here for a little bit because it is very important for us to recognize that as professionals, we are the custodians of the built and natural environment and our work will directly affect the rights of people. So global agreements are increasingly raising the issues of a socio-ecological decline and seeking that broad consensus that action does need to be taken and need to be taken soon. So the context is shifting with transboundary developments in international environmental law. And it's been suggested that this global pact, we could be on the cusp of a defining global environmental constitutional moment. And this could have the potential to reshape the world and our professional responsibilities in a similar transformation not seen since the mid 20th century, which saw the establishment, of course, of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization. And this has defined legal norms on human rights and economic cooperation and trade. So we're at the cusp where this pact, once it gets ratified, has the potential to have that transformative impact and how that would then filter down to us as professionals 
and how it would explicitly affect our duty of care. And so it is something that we need to be cognizant of and something that we should actually be involved in shaping. So I'd like to continue the whirlwind tour through the various aspects by touching on finance and looking to this industry, which again has a hugely transformative impact on our work at all levels. Many of you would have heard of the Task Force of Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFDs. Now, it did release its recommendations quite a while ago, and it provides an overall framework for companies and organizations to take and develop uh, climate financial disclosures through their existing reporting process. Um, it's structured around governance, strategy, risk management and metrics, including targets. So it, it's there to ensure that companies that invest in activities are aware that they could not be viable in the longer term unless they are resilient to climate risks and climate change. And that where they are investing in these aspects, their investments may experience lower financial returns. This was echoed by the ex, why well, is he still serving? I can't remember. The ex Bank of Eve, uh, Gov England uh, governor, who did bluntly state that companies that ignore the climate emergency will go bankrupt. And he highlighted that currently about 20 trillion US dollars of assets could be wiped out. So I think that's quite conservative, to be honest. But anyway, TCFD to date has a lot of supporters. 785 are listed which has a huge capitalization 9.2 trillion US dollars and then financial firms which are responsible for further assets of 118 trillion US dollars so there is some form of movement in the financial industry and it has started to gain support from governments and financial regulators around the world the hope is that through these related risks and opportunities reporting, it will become a natural part of companies' risk management. So companies and investors will start to really understand the financial implications associated with climate change, and they will become more important and useful in decision-making where risks and opportunities are accurately priced. And this hope is that it would allow for more efficient allocation of capital, contributing to a more orderly transition to a low carbon economy. So this will have a direct impact on how we look at buildings and assets in terms of both their financing and their valuation based on their perceived climate risk. In fact, in Singapore, we're having discussions with banks who already use the rating tool here to actually disperse green loans and financing to developments, which because it lowers their, their financial risk. So they're able to offer more competitive loans. So actually it becomes a virtual a virtuous cycle of I do a, a green building which is rated I get lower rates of interest which makes it cheaper which means I'm encouraged to do more so beyond TCFDs in Europe there's an EU sustainable finance taxonomy which actually is a, a, a labeling of sustainable financial products which is labeled from brown to green um, it looks at indicators. Um, the indicators are climate change mitigation, adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and protection of healthy ecosystems. So for an action uh, to meet the definition of, of being an environmentally sustainable economic activity, it must contribute substantially to one of these environmental objectives. And then beyond that, do no harm to any of the other environmental objectives there. Also comply with social safeguards and then comply with uh, technical screening or due diligence criteria. So this has been coupled with legislation which came into force last year, which relates to disclosures. So again, building on TCFDs. And this will really help encourage and drive um, a greater transition in the finance industry in the future. So whilst this EU taxonomy is the global gold standard, other markets in such as Southeast Asia where the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore, they've also started to set out guidelines for banks to develop policies on environmentally or socially uh, sensitive sectors. But in reality, 
the, the progress is a little slow, as you can see from this slide. I'm not going to go through it, but the key here is only three banks have in ASEAN have actually adopted simple things like no deforestation policies or the prohibition of uh, financing new coal power plants. And these same three blanks are the only supporters of TCFD. So what do we want to take away from this? Well, I think in summary, change in finance is coming. It may not be as rapid as we hope, but as many of us in our professional roles are involved with either valuation or investment decisions directly or indirectly, we must be responsive and responsible in our professional advice, taking into account the changes in the finance industry, the perceived risk of climate change and uh, adaptation, and making sure that we do include that as we go forward, if we aren't already. The final stop in setting the scene is looking at frameworks. So these frameworks, you're looking at um, a number uh, such as the New Urban Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. So the world does face a growing number of challenges, and this starts with your inequality, um, the rapid rate of urbanization, and how that's tied to resource depletion. So we're going to dip into these now. So of course, as mentioned, with the population expecting to, to nearly double, it's going to make urbanization the 21st century's most transformative issues. Now, as built environment professionals, we can and should provide many of the solutions to this to improve human health, well-being, foster resilience and protect the environment. Of course, this is a lot of tension here. You want to grow the economy that usually involves resources, which are under pressure. With economic growth, how do you deal with poverty? Is it equal growth, equal opportunity, or is it looking at pure GDP growth? So we need to look at how we manage these conflicts within three pillars. Now, the new urban agenda is one of the frameworks which really helped to do this, looking at urban development. And it's an opportunity for us to engage with policymakers, other professionals and financiers around the shared agenda. And that shared agenda is quite simply, leave no one behind, ensure sustainable inclusive economies and ensure environmental sustainability. So it tries to overcome the typical development tensions, which we all know and we've been discussing for decades, to be honest. Now, I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but as you can see, I've summarised all the guiding principles within the new urban agenda and the actions that can be taken. All of these fall within our professional scope of works, again, leading me to state that we are the solution providers. Our profession is the solution providers to the world problems if we grasp this and start to act upon it. And successful transformation of cities, you know, they need the following implementation. So this is the how. So urban rules and regulations, in essence, standards and regulation, which is something that RICS members are involved with and do very well. Urban planning and design, so those of us involved in planning and development, or working with others in that field, you know, we can work very strongly to Together to establish the adequate provision of common goods and common goals which really help with that. Now the finance, again, a huge role of what many of our professionals do is deal with finance. And then national robust urban policies. So again, how are we involved as a professional body or individually as professionals in working on setting or commenting on or driving for greater changes in our own national policies around climate change and the built environment. So all of these are actually anchored around the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, these icons have been brought around everywhere now. Everyone is flashing them um, with many presentations, and sometimes they have a very dubious link to what's being talked about. But it's a very good shared agenda and a very good way of framing the plan for, of action for people, planet, and prosperity. And it's a key for us working together to deliver that new form of urbanization that delivers all of the above. And that's where the Value the Planet campaign comes in. Um, it does talk about the Sustainable Development Goals and frame it in our profession, how we work with it. 
something that I've been working on in Singapore, which is going to be published um, in the book, will be published, I believe, by the end of May. And this is where we've actually taken a slightly different approach. What we've done is we've translated those um, SDGs into professional architectural practice in the context of Singapore, which has slightly different regulatory regime than other parts. So these have been turned into seven environmental design guidelines, and it talks purely about how practicing architects can implement these at a practice level and a project level, guiding them through key metrics and measurables with qualitative and quantitative goals and indicators. So it's a, it, is a, it is a good translation, which makes it very focused and something that can be implemented um, today. And I will happily share on this in the future um, once it's formally published. However, it's not all a bed of roses. Um, you know, our profession, to be honest, and our allied professionals, we're entangled with, and in many cases, complicit, actually, in sustaining multiple drivers of Earth system destruction and ecological injustices. To date, I would argue that professionals as a whole have not been sufficiently ambitious, and that includes our professional body, to deal with the increasingly assertive and destructive modes of urbanization and economic growth. And we're coming under increasing scrutiny. Um, we all know the uh, Extinction Rebellion protests and just general public sentiment, and that is quite dangerous because again, we talked about an erosion of trust at the beginning. This could be a key erosion of our professional trust and without trust we we are not able to act effectively as a profession so we have achieved wonderful feats or inspiring places solve many of humanity's pressing issues but for all of our successes the profession at large and other professions have not been able to confront head-on the ever-deepening socio-ecological crisis that is engulfing the living order and our sector suffers from a fragmented problem shifting adversarial approach which does not always allow climate change issues to be given the due consideration that they really require so i'd like to hit this home it, that it is a problem that's no longer just for other people i know that a lot of people signed up to this are based in the uk so to give a uk example of something which is happening now the village of Fairbourne, in 25 years, all the residents will be forced to leave this village because it will be decommissioned. The council are unable to protect it from climate change. So when we talk about decommissioned, it's the whole village. Houses, shops, roads, sewers, gas, electricity, services will all be dismantled. The entire village will be turned back into a salt marsh. And to note, sea defences were actually recently upgraded, and it was at a cost of £6.8 million, which was there to extend the life of this village. So you can imagine this kind of decision would not be taken lightly in the UK and by the council, but the financial pain that that would cause to the residents. So houses have lost more than 40% of their value, and that will continue to drop. People who have recently purchased property are now in negative equity, and those wishing to purchase can't get mortgages because the banks can't loan it because they're unmortgageable. So again, as a profession, we are involved in giving advice, in valuations, in surveys, in looking at um, potential increases of value, looking at risks and things like that. So, would or could we be liable in future to the banks, to insurance companies, and of course to the people living there in the future? What about the social costs as well? If they've relied on a professional to give them advice and this happens, although we can say it's out of our control, we do know quite about the climate science, we do know what's going on. So will it again lead to an erosion of trust in the professional because we're not taking climate change as seriously as we potentially should do? And whilst this may be shocking in a UK context, this is happening in many parts of the world on a daily occurrence. Now, the construction industry, well known, architects and engineers declare, it's a, no, it's a known movement, but is it really enough just to declare a crisis? 
what I'd like to see is those in practice who have signed up to this making change immediately. That is not to say it isn't an important movement. Honestly, it is. But we all need to get beyond the posturing and into real solutioning. And there are fantastic examples out there, and many companies are delivering projects that embody and employ a great response to climate crisis that we have today. It's about making these the norm. These should now be business as usual, rather than winning awards as being highlighted as the exception. So a crisis demands immediate action. Now, what we're seeing all around the world now, and being in Singapore, I'm seeing this greatly, um, is a response right now to a health crisis, the coronavirus. Okay. Now, this has been a kind of a measured response, one in which the cost of compliance is not debated. So imagine for a moment the health sector debating the cost premium for temperature screening, for mandatory leave of absence of 14 days. And in the same way that we talk about the cost of going for environmental ratings, or the cost or economic competitiveness of raising minimum standards in our, built in, in our building legislation, of, dare I say, demanding high quality places and place making and buildings. And yet, for the last 30 to 40 years, our arguments have tend to hinge about a, a mythical cost premium, and we've remained largely static in an increasingly evidence-based world of significant climate change, of widespread and damaging consequences for all of us. And I think this needs to change, and our response needs to be collective as a professional, leading the other professionals where needs be, so working with our architects, with our engineers, with our clients, with our investors to be coordinated and serious and to ta target the problem head on knowing that there could be short-term inconveniences and dealing with it just like we are all dealing with the current crisis that's unfolding with the coronavirus so the value of the planet campaign it is developed as a way that we can demonstrate our ability to deliver the sustainable development goals within our diverse practices and further the built environment and natural environments necessary orientation towards climate action. It's something that we really need to do. Now, whilst this is one of the key outcomes, it should be understood that the UN SDGs are based on the premise of sustainable human development, aligned with the, anthrop aligned with the three pillared approach to sustainable development. So, I use the term unsustainable development goals as a bit of a play here because one of my favorite quotes from uh, someone involved in writing the, um, well, involved in drafting the UN Global Pact is it's actually helping with the unbridled development that pushes ecological interest to the periphery of regulatory concerns whilst prioritizing social and economic development at the expense of both global earth system integrity and meaning sol solidarity between peoples. So, in other words, are the SDGs actually continuing to perpetuate that it is possible to achieve ongoing, expanded, business-as-usual economic growth within a limited Earth system, although based on continual consumption? So I would argue that actually the SDGs do not offer a radically different alternative for steering human actions on a path towards greater Earth system integrity, but I do believe it is necessary that our profession engage with that and with the new urban agenda urgently. We operate in realities of the, of the current global economic system and we need to have greater traction within this structure to offer the necessary changes to policies that can then influence the operation going forward to make sure that we do operate within the planetary boundaries and earth system integrity. So coming to the end here, it's about what we must or what we can do. So in the Valley of the Planet campaign, they did have a list of three things as a start. The first one is, of course, to adopt a whole of life thinking. So decisions that are made at the early stage of the project, they do have lifelong impacts and we need to bring this in up front. They must be considered and communicated and treated with the diligence that we do with health and safety issues, for example. 
don't have a We need to collaborate, again, in our risk adverse, in our blame culture that we sometimes have in our projects and the current way that procurement operates. We need to, to mobilise the investors, know what we know, work with the developers, talk about sustainable finance, highlight to the policymakers their obligations and also the legal recourses that happen, work with our supply chain and end users and, of course, our professional bodies that represent the voice of the sector. And that's something that I've been trying to do from inside RSCS as part of the governing council is to really shift that conversation on climate change that you know we should be taking the lead, bridging the other professional bodies and jointly leading it with them. climate change so the campaign as it stands i really hope provides a useful means to develop a rigorous framework and a practical measure for us as a profession in our various different pathways and, and areas to develop an earth-centric approach for our practice whether we develop it into a framework similar to what I did with the Singapore Institute of Architects or whether we develop it in a different way. But at the centre, we must acknowledge that we have professional duties, responsibilities. That has all come together as a profession. Be bold in transforming our diverse work for the good of our people, our planet and, of course, our practices. I would argue that what we cannot do is preserve the status quo. If we do, as a profession, we will need to be comfortable with the fact and really accept the responsibility that will come with that decision that we're preserving the root causes of the socio-ecological crisis that we find ourselves in today. And I know it's easy to say all these things and it's easy to present it because words alone will not change behaviour. But as a profession, better words can prompt better behaviour. And this campaign pushes for a more ambitious framework and a means for our practice to address the, sy the systematic changes and systemic challenges that are ahead of us. And again, I'd like to say we really need to position ourselves as the solution providers for a more ecologically sound world. And we need to do this now to make sure that we can maintain trust in our profession. So, um, I understand I may have dropped off a bit. I hope uh, my signal has come back nice and strong. Uh, but anyway, um, we are reaching the end. So, I'm happy to open it up for, for any questions that you may have. So if you do have any questions, what you can do is there's a question module and you can type it in and then you can, um, I can answer those questions as they come in. Okay, I think I'm struggling to see the questions. Let me have a...
cost perspective um, and you can always bring in exactly what we brought in here that actually in terms of risk and in terms of opportunity um, in the future there's quite a lot of risk uh, by not having um, climate um, action so it's really about communication um, and it's about trying to really work and collaborate with the architects and with the engineers about what can be done and if it's say quantity surveying then it's of course looking at life cycle costing or even right sizing and how design optimization can really actually lower the capital cost as well as improve the overall cost okay right next one will the new plans work knowing that older plans have failed we are witnessing major changes in the climate and no government is taking necessary preventive action yes um, i agree we are witnessing major changes in climate and governments are not taking the necessary action so as a profession as professional bodies who provide advice this is where we should be getting involved um, we should really be lobbying our own professional body to take a stance and with that we can go into government uh, and to say look you're not and these uh, UN uh, like the draft UN global pact and the Paris agreement are catalysts which allow us allow for us to actually hold governments accountable through legal mechanisms so that is improving um, and for those of us who work in the public sector like myself it's about being an advocate it's about really laying down the arguments with facts and figures that we should be doing more. And these are the benefits of doing that. So for example, um, what we're looking at in Singapore at the moment, and something that I've been advocating for some time, is how we raise our minimum legislative standards to such a high level that it's almost equivalent to the best in class um, in, our environment, in our environmental rating at the moment. So it's about really continuing to advocate both as an individual uh, as a professional and working with those professional bodies um, to really get them to, to to lobby and if all else fails we have the legal frameworks to fall back on um, later another very interesting question um, how do we balance the need of affordable property in homes while increasing the value of sustainable property through incorporating the value of renewable technologies, fabrics, and sustainable development. Well, there are uh, there's a case study in the UK which um, was which won the Sterling Prize, um, which was a passive house standard. So, even though it cost the council a little bit more, it was done from the point of um, for affordable housing. It's not just about the initial cost; it's also about the cost for the occupants inside. So low cost housing, often you don't have as much disposable income to spend on heating bills, for example. So designing to that higher standard enables um, a better social uh, quality um, because you're not wasting money on keeping something warm. Um, in terms of balance, so in the tropics um, where I am, um, a lot of people think that it costs a lot more to have um, property which is environmentally sustainable when actually the opposite is the true it's wonderful what we can do with passive design um, especially here um, which moves away from air conditioning so technically it is possible um, and with renewables there are business opportunities um, which move beyond the traditional i have to buy to own but it is i can lease or i can um, have a, a business model which is um, energy as a service so that way that you end up paying lower rates than um, the electrical tariff and it's produced on site or off site from renewables um, so those are the things there okay right it should be legislated that environmental ratings for new buildings 
should it be legislated um, for projects in Australia to have uh, environmental ratings? If so, which rating tool should we use? Briam, LEED or Green Star? I would say you should usually use your local rating tool. I know the guys at Green Star, they do wonderful work. Um, and supporting the local rating tool is, is good because it is contextual. Um, use rating tools which are holistic in their approach. Uh, the monometric rating tools I'm always a bit dubious of. Um, it's a bit like how we measured uh, car efficiency. Uh, so everyone went and bought a diesel car because they had much lower CO2 emissions uh, per kilometer, but look where that got us. So when you are looking at environmental rating tools, look at those which are holistic. And legislation does work um, in raising the minimum standard for uh, which again, using Singapore as an example, we our legislation for environmental sustainability is based around our rating tool. And for key sites, for government land sales sites in growth areas, we actually have mandated that they must meet the highest rating of platinum, which is a good start. I don't think it's good enough. We need to really look at how we build upon those rating tools to not be less bad, but actually start to become even more positive. Another question, I hope that answered it. Feel free, if you want me to expand, then feel free to uh, carry on writing. Where do you see the role of a surveyor at a project inception stage if the project is not sustainable? Okay, so that's a very, very good question. Where do you see the role of surveyor? The surveyor, again, should be an advocate. Um, if it's not sustainable, it's how can you make, you have to make a choice. Do I not support it? Do I wash my hands of that project and say my practice will no longer support or be involved with projects which are inherently unsustainable? That's one option. The other option is if I am involved in this project, how do I make it the best it can be to minimize that damage? So again, how do you do that? you work with the project team and you take an advocacy position to say that this is not good enough, this is what we need to do, and you start to map it out. You can use a risk register, very similar to how we do with health and safety. Um, use that risk register and put climate risks on there and then work with the project team in, in to really drive that. So like I say, I would go, with it. There's, there's two ways, either you get your hands dirty in there and run the risk of being accused of you know, being involved in a very unsustainable project, but knowing that you can say, I've tried my best to make it as good as possible, given, this, given the issues. Okay, what will be the solution for zero carbon buildings in the UK? Now, the UK is actually blessed with a lot of natural resources and land, uh, it has wind, tide, it does get some sun, uh, believe it or not. So the solution for zero carbon buildings is actually quite straightforward. So minimize the issues. Uh, so you look at a passive first approach. So things like passive house standards are a good way of doing that. Then you look at optimization. So are there aspects which can reduce energy wastage? Then you look at the last point, on-site and off-site renewables in terms of materials that you use, are you being wasteful in materials? Where are they coming from? Are they rapidly renewable? So again, the use of timber is back in vogue. Um, alternative materials, um, I think there was it the University of Cambridge decided, showed that you could, or was it uh, the Bartlett? Um, one of the projects um, used cork as an example. So there's lots of materials that you can actually use um, to reduce the embodied energy. So it's using materials wisely. Um, it's the time and fees to design up front, which make sure you have a coordinated design, which means that the professions aren't designing three separate buildings, which the poor contractor then has to work out how to put together on site. Um, so it's a mix of on-site and off-site renewables to offset all of that energy. So the World Green Building Council actually have quite a simplistic but effective roadmap on that, uh, where they look at how we achieve operational net, net zero and then offsets for the remaining, which is the embodied carbon. Okay, uh, carbon emissions within cities are low when viewed from a 
per capita basis. That's relatively true. Um, how true are infrastructural changes going to happen at a how are, are true infrastructural changes going to happen at a local government level to create true sustainable development when in reality they appear to be too many barriers to truly commercially viable developments? Okay, now I agree with that. Um, again, going back to we like to talk about a climate crisis, but we tend to peddle the same stuff of how much extra is it going to cost? So it's about how we reframe that argument. So what I shared with regard to the financial levers, which are the starting with the TCFDs and moving forward with the EU legislation um, and the taxonomy, that will hopefully reduce those financial obstacles um, to being commercially viable. And the other thing is more and more case studies. So again, linking back to the Sterling Prize winning scheme of social housing, that was done by local council. Now local councils have to be extremely um, astute with their money. In fact, more prudent than many private sector developers uh, doing their low cost housing, for example. And they also don't have the ability to have selective tenders and things like that. So it, it really becomes about price. So if they're able to develop, say, low cost housing to passive house standards, then there are case studies out there which help overcome that. But again, it's about advocacy. Oh, I understand you lost me again. Um, sorry about that. And that was right at the end of my answer. Okay, right, sorry, you've got me again. Okay, so it, again, a lot of it boils down to using case studies to demonstrate that it is viable and it can be done. Um, and again, this links to another question about cost saving. Uh, they are cost focused and sustainable elements aren't cheap. Um, but again, you, you work to a budget. So how do you cut away the waste? And that often comes from design optimization. So one of the things that I find in my role from assessing buildings um, in the tropics, especially with things like air conditioning, there's a gross over provision of it. So there's a huge amount of redundancy. So you work on the redundancies. Um, there's one project in Singapore. Um, there's one project in Singapore which is a zero energy building, um, which is quite hard to do here um, at the time. And it's a university project. And when we asked them about the cost premium, how much extra did it cost to be zero energy and it's on site zero energy? They said it didn't cost anything. And the reason it didn't cost anything extra, in fact, they're looking at savings, is because they did it from the ground up. They actually sat down and coordinated the design. They stripped away what is unnecessary. Um, in terms of their air conditioning system, they use an alternative way of doing it. Um, so they use a very logical way, which is let's elevate the temperature away from this 22 to 24 degrees Celsius and have it operating at, say, 26 and 27 degrees Celsius with a ceiling fan, which is highly comfortable. Um, so by doing that, all of a sudden your capacity is reduced, the amount of equipment is reduced, and then you start looking at your materials and what you need. Um, so of course there was a aesthetic decision to strip back some of the materials, so you know leaving columns bare. Um, when it comes to ceilings, just having baffles instead of false ceilings and things like that. So it's how it's how you look at those design choices all the way through the project, and then linking that with financial products of how do you actually get a lower rate of a loan, which can then help in terms of financing it. Now I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to answer one more question, um, which is. Are you optimistic that the tide can be turned and there is sufficient international collaboration and action to get on top of the crisis and turn it round? That's a very big question. And part of me, I'm, I'm actually torn. The optimist in me is really saying that yes, um, based on when crisis hit, we tend to as, as we are, for example, with the coronavirus going on, we've put measures in place very quickly. Now, the issue is, do we have to wait for what we have now, which is a minor crisis, to turn into a major crisis before we act? And my worry is we're going to wait till it's too late. So, yeah, I am worried that we may not actually 
get on top of the crisis in time and we'll be then looking at deep adaptation um but i really hope that collectively as a profession we can again take a position that we need to make systematic and structural changes now and we need to really do this with all of our projects and they take a take a stance and by doing that at least if we can't turn it around we can delay the impacts for greater technology which will come into carbon capture and storage um, mass tree replanting and then hopefully deployment on a global scale of renewables to work and collaboration but yeah i'm a little bit unoptimistic um if i haven't answered the all the questions that have been posted what we can do is um i can look through and follow up by email um potentially i'll have to go through what's there and um i think we've run out of out of time but just to confirm that um RICS will follow up with a full recording, um, which will be sent out um, to everyone. And um, yeah, and hopefully I'll get a full set of the questions and then I'll try and answer them as best I can by email. Now, I, it's a bit weird. This is my first time doing a presentation in, without having people to gauge reaction from. So um, I hope it came off quite well and I hope you found it quite useful and you can apply it in your work. And it's good to stay abreast of all these issues. And hopefully, again, as I say, as a profession, we can come together and come together with our other professions to get on top of the issue, be involved in the international environmental law developments because this will affect us. And I'd rather we work within it rather than be reactive to it. Okay, so um, that's it. I'm going to have to end there. Thank you very much for attending. And um, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Okay, thank you very much.